Let the church say amen. amen. I'm very grateful for another opportunity for all of us to study together. And uh, today is going to be a very, um, it's going to be a very serious study. I'm going to be speaking both to youth and adult. And I know that God is going to show us some things that are going to challenge us in our walk with him. But if we receive the challenge right, it will be a blessing to our heart. So as we prepare our hearts for this very serious subject of practical godliness in light of last day events, I would like to invite as much of you as are able to, let's kneel together and let's approach the Lord in prayer. And if you can't kneel, just bow your heads where you are, but let us all pray together. Father in heaven, we are grateful. We thank you that your spirit consistently speaks to our heart. We realize that we are living in very serious and solemn times in Earth's history. And Lord, I know that you want to truly draw our hearts to heaven in a very powerful way. Please, Lord, speak to us today. Make your words plain. But more importantly, give us ears to hear. Help us that in our minds we will be willing to receive the truths that heaven so desperately wants to give. And I am not forgetful. And help us not to be forgetful to give you praise, honor, and glory for the things that you have taught us today is our prayer we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good, good, good. When John the Revelator saw an angel fly in the midst of heaven, he said that this angel was giving the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. When you think about the gospel, we have to understand what it is and then know how to apply it to Revelation 14, which is a very foundational text to those who name the name of Seventh-day Adventists. So I want you to see what the Bible says as we go now to the book of Romans chapter 1. We're going to go to Romans, the first chapter, and I want you to see what the Bible says as we consider the verse. Uh, Romans, the first chapter, and we're going to consider verse 16. And when you get there, please let me know by saying amen. Romans 1, verse 16. Well, I would imagine. Let's, let's do this. I'm going to back up just a little bit. Let's go to Mark 16 first, and then we'll go to Romans 1, 16. Let's go to Mark 16 first. I want to set just a little bit more of a foundation. So we're going to Mark 16, and we're going to notice the words of Jesus to his disciples. And we learned this morning that we are also his disciples as well. And the Bible says in Mark 16 and verse 15, and if you're there, please say amen. The Bible says in Mark 16 and verse 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into how much? All of the world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So the commission that Christ gave to the church, the commission that Christ gave is to preach the gospel to every creature all over the world. This is for every disciple. It is not just for pastors. It is not just for elders. It is for every member of the church because we've learned that every member of the church is a disciple. And when Jesus gave this commission in Mark 16, he was speaking to disciples. So Christ expects you and I to play our part. We cannot count on ministers to do the work. God has called all of you to be ministers in your various fields and spheres of life, and he wants all of us to play our part in the proclamation of the gospel. So now what is the gospel? Now we're going to Romans 1, 16. So when we go to Romans 1 and verse 16, we find then that the gospel is defined in a very beautiful way by the Apostle Paul in Romans 1 and verse 16. And here's what the Bible says. The Bible says in Romans 1 and verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is what? Notice that. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, when we consider this, that means then that the gospel is not limited to lip service because God says that he called it power. And power is more than something you talk about. Power is something you demonstrate. Power is something you experience. This is why in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, notice what the Bible says. Watch how Paul magnifies this point. Paul just said in Romans 1, 16, that the gospel is God's power. Now we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to consider verse 5. 
And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5. If you're there, please say amen. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in what? Power. Notice, that, notice how the Apostle Paul differentiated gospel power from words. Did you catch that? He said, our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power. So power is definitely something that goes beyond words. You can speak powerfully, but there's something even more powerful. And we're going to talk about it because now I want you to see the best way. What is the best way to actually preach the gospel? Right now, you are getting ready to enter into something here, specifically in Iloilo, where you're going to be getting, gearing up for the year of evangelism, a time where individuals are going to be giving the everlasting gospel to those all around us. And it is imperative that we do it right. Now, I want to show you the foundation of gospel giving or gospel preaching. Jesus commissioned us to preach the gospel, no doubt. Jesus then says the gospel is definitely more than lip service. So what really does he mean? Now we're going to go to Deuteronomy, and we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I want you to see what the Bible says in Deuteronomy, the 6th chapter. And I want you to watch the verses very carefully as we are going to look at a method of evangelism that was actually endorsed by God. And I want you to see how he spells it out here in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I want you to see what it says here. Watch this now. Very, very powerful uh, passage of Scripture. Oh, I'm so sorry. Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 6 is good. Deuteronomy 4 is better. Let's go to Deuteronomy 4. I think Deuteronomy 4 makes it even more clear. In Deuteronomy 4, look at verses 5 and 6 carefully. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 4, verses 5 and 6, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Now, after God has made it clear that he taught them these things, look at what he says now in verse 6. He says, Keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the what? In the sight of the nations which shall what? Hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. The same way that God wanted Israel to be viewed by the world as a wise and understanding nation is the same way God wants the world to view Seventh-day Adventists as a wise and understanding people. And one of the things that you see in this verse is that before they were heard, they were first seen. Is that right? Did you catch that? Look at the verse again in verse 6. It says, keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. And then after the nations see, it says, which shall hear all these things about your God. You see, the best way to preach the gospel is when people hear things from us, they could say they see consistency in our lives. When you and I live lives that are contrary to the gospel message we preach, it damages your witness. It literally damages your witness. People do not want to join more hypocrisy because the world is already filled with hypocrisy. The churches are filled with hypocrisy. What the world needs to see is an example of Jesus, somebody who lives what they preach. This is the great crisis that the church is in right now. The reason why people do not take religion seriously, the reason why individuals begin to become irreligious and we find so many, especially our youth, leaving the church is because they are not seeing a match between what's preached from the pulpit and what's lived off the pulpit. It is for this reason that if we are going to enter into a year of evangelism, it has to be more than simply getting ready to give lots of messages. We must make sure that we are living our message. The more that we live our message, the greater we are empowered to preach the message, and people will say, surely this is a wise and understanding people. Now, in order to do that, Notice, in what respect does God liken coming to Christ? 
When we think about us coming to Jesus, because we want to unite people with Christ. Well, if we're going to unite people with Christ, we certainly should be united to Christ. Doesn't that make sense? So think about it. What does God liken coming to Christ? Well, the Bible says, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. God likens us coming to Christ like when a man and woman come together in holy matrimony, marriage. God literally likens us coming to Christ as individuals who come together in a marriage covenant. It is for this reason that when you think about a marriage, there are things that make a marriage work and there are things that can destroy a marriage. When we think about things that make a marriage work, think about it. In what respects are a successful marriage and the Christian life similar? Well, notice the text. The Bible says, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are what? The goal of a successful marriage is that when the husband serves the wife and the wife serves the husband, there should be one key motive in doing it, and that is that we may please the one that we have pledged our lives to. When a husband understands, I do not help my wife wash dishes, I do not help my wife clean the house, I do not help my wife do anything except for the mere reason that I want to do it to please her, to let her know this is my way of saying, honey, I love you. When a wife wants to assist the husband and help work with the husband and encourage that husband, that wife should have a pure motive. That motive should be that they want to please the one that they have pledged their lives to. In the Bible, the, God, the Bible says in the book of 2 Timothy, go to 2 Timothy with me, and we're going to 2 Timothy, and we're going to consider 2 Timothy, and I'll tell you the chapter in just a second here, 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, you will notice that God likens us to his soldiers. And when he likens us unto his soldiers, I want you to see what he says about the motive of the soldier's service to him. The Bible says in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, and if you're there, say Amen. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting at verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore, now watch these words in verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good what? As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now watch verse 4. No man warreth, no man that warreth, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Why? The finishing of the verse. That he may do what? That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. God has chosen you, God has chosen me to be soldiers in his army. And the motive of our service to our general should be only we do what we do that we may please him. This, brothers and sisters, should be the motive of all Christian service. It should never be, well, I got to go out and win souls because my pastor told me to. Oh, I got to go out and win souls because my mother told me to. We should be willing as good faithful soldiers in the Lord's army to go forward and win souls that we may please the one who has enlisted us in his spiritual army. If you understand what the preacher is saying thus far, let me hear you say amen. amen. And so it is that Christ likens our union with him as with a marriage. The function in a marriage of servitude, husband to wife and wife to husband, is that they may please one another. Our service to God, our heavenly husband, is we do what we do that we may please him. Now, the same way that there are things that please God, we must understand there are, there are things that don't please God. I remember one of the greatest forms of education that I received was when I began to learn about things that my wife didn't like. I actually thought it was, you know, I appreciated it because I am consumed with the idea of serving my wife. I'm consumed with that idea. Lord, teach me how to serve my bride. I still refer to my wife as my bride. Even after 17 years of marriage, she is still my bride. And when I think about my bride, I want to do everything possible to please her, please her, not to the compromise of truth, righteousness, and principle, but according to what God has said that the house band has a right to do in pleasing his wife. And so it is that when you and I think about our marriage, we should be happy to understand what it is. And I must tell you, there were some things I found out that didn't please my wife. And when I would talk to her and she would just say, you know, Dwayne, I actually don't like that. And I'll say, really? 
And it would kind of surprise me because, you know, it's very easy for a husband to do certain things thinking that his wife likes it when she doesn't. So I did that. And here it is. She said, you know, I really don't like when that happens. And I said, is that right? I said, well, then you know what? By the grace of God, I will not do that anymore. I don't mind making a sacrifice to please my bride. Brothers and sisters, the same way that we can function like that in an earthly marriage, God wants us to understand that there's a way we should function like that when it comes to our heavenly marriage. There are things that definitely please God, but there are some things that don't. And the thing that definitely does not please God is something called worldliness. Worldliness does not please God. There is something that is called worldliness that in the eyes of God, he says, these things do not please me. Yea, God says, I hate them. And brothers and sisters, if we are united to Christ, then our purpose, our motive in servitude is that we may do what to him? Please him. And if we find out that worldliness does not please him, then we should seek every way possible to avoid worldliness. What is worldliness? The Bible says, love not the world neither the things that are in the world. It says, because the love of, for, for if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, what are the things of the world? The lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. These are things that the Bible says is worldliness, that God says, this does not please me. God says, this is what I do not want to see represented in my people. If we are going to go to individuals to join the church, I want you to think about this. When we do missionary work, our goal is to get them to accept God and his truth and to be united with the Lord in his church. Is that right? This is what the great emphasis is. Now, I want you to understand, if this is the emphasis, then we need to understand something about the church. The first time the word church comes up in all the Bible is in Matthew 16. And it's when Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The word church is a Greek word called ecclesia. The Greek word ecclesia, what it means is the called out ones. That's what ecclesia is, the church. When you think of the church, it was not meant to just be a building where people just come together. The church was a group of people that God has called out. Called out of what? 1 Peter chapter 2. Turn there with me. In 1 Peter chapter 2, notice what the Bible sh clearly shows what the church, God's people, were called out of. Notice what the Bible says. 1 Peter chapter 2, and notice what the text says as we consider verse 9. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, and if you're there, please let me know by saying amen. The Bible says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him, watch this, who has called you out of what? Darkness into his marvelous Light. So when you think of the church, you're thinking of the word ecclesia, the called out ones. What is it that we were called out of? The Bible calls it darkness, but a better terminology is the world. God has called us out of worldliness, and he's called us into his marvelous light. And there are many things that God calls light. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. God says, my word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalms 119, 105. Proverbs 6 and verse 23, the Bible says that God's law is a lamp and a light. So when we are called into the marvelous light, we are called into God's word. We are called into God's commandments. We are called into Christ that we may reflect his light, his character, and not worldliness, the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life. These things are contrary to the principles of God. This is why, how serious is Jesus about this counsel? Well, think about it this way. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is what? Enmity, that means hatred with God. When we cling to worldliness, it is a testimony that we hate God. Can you imagine that somebody could actually say they love God, but at the same time, they're testifying they hate him by their actions. And that's why actions always speak louder than words. So here it is, it says, Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. 
Going on, the Bible also says in James 1, 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. These are things that God is making so clear. The true revelation of the child of God in the last days are individuals that there is no spot of worthiness that is connected to their lifestyle, their conversation, and the various choices that they make day by day. And this is why we need to study really what practically is worldliness. What really is it? Why? Because brothers and sisters, if the truth be told, a lot of us can say we love Jesus with our lips, but by our lifestyles, we demonstrate we love the world and its practices. And God wants to separate that from us. But I want to establish a very important principle before we progress in the study. I want you to go to John, the third chapter with me. In John, the third chapter, this is a very important point. Whenever you're dealing with the issue of sin and worldliness, it is important that we make sure we establish a point, And I believe it's imperative that we understand it from John three. The Bible says in John, the third chapter, and uh, when you get there, please say amen. The Bible says in John chapter 3, looking at verse 19, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says, and this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. God makes it clear that, listen, you are not condemned simply because we are doing something wrong. It is when the light comes to us that we see the light, we understand the light. It is at that time that when we see the light and understand the light that we are to accept the light and walk in the light. If we do that, you're not condemned. But when we see the light, when we understand the light, and when we choose to say, I don't want that light, I don't like that light, that light disrupts my lifestyle, and that light, quite honestly, makes me mad. I reject that light. When we reject that light, the Bible says condemnation comes. Our study this day is not to condemn. This study is not a message of condemnation. This study is a message of education. I believe God's people need greater education that we can understand his words. It is fruitless and it is pointless if we are a bunch of worldly people and we're going to try to tell worldly people to come out of the world into a church filled with worldly people. That doesn't make any sense, brothers and sisters. And this is why you would be amazed to know that God is blocking a lot of people from joining the church right now. God is blocking a lot of people. Somebody says, but wait a minute, I know places where lots of people are joining the church. The question is simple, who sent them? It, just because people join a church does not always mean God sent them. Did you know that? Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. Study your Bibles. Read about the mixed multitude. When the mixed multitude joined with Israel, they were some of the chief individuals that would constantly lead Israel into apostasy. So there are times where Satan can send people in the church to make the church more worldly. In fact, I'm going to show you one of the strongest statements Jesus ever made about soul winning and how much he was, in a, in, in a degree, he was against the idea as it relates to the method of how the Pharisees were doing it. Go to Matthew 23. These are some strong words. This came right from Jesus' mouth. And I want you to consider this because we know that proselytizing, in other words, seeking to get individuals to join with God's church, there's no sin in that. But if the church, if God's people are comfortable and maintain in a certain condition, Jesus himself will literally hold back people from joining the church. And I want to show you an example of how Jesus addressed proselytizing, this, this effort of soul winning. It was in Matthew 23. Matthew 23 is a very powerful chapter uh, in the Bible, in the New Testament. It's Jesus literally woeing the Pharisees and calling them hypocrites for various reasons. And I want you to see what it says in Matthew 23, and we're going to look at verse 15. After Jesus was calling the Pharisees hypocrites for many reasons, he says something in Matthew 23, 15 that is powerful. He said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Now look at what he says next. For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. That's strong. That is strong. Jesus said, you Pharisees, you are such hypocrites that he says you go all 
over the world to win people to the church. And when they join the church, he says, your influence makes them double the children of hell than you were. That's strong language, brothers and sisters. This is why we need a message that warns us of worldliness, because worldliness has come in our ranks. There are many of us who have a name Seventh-day Adventist, but we still love the world and its practices, and God needs to take that out of us if we are really going to do a year of evangelism. If we're really going to win souls, those people need to see that we are children of God as they hear that we are children of God. So this reason, we have to do some serious studies. So I want you to watch this now. So where do I begin in the process of avoiding worldliness? If worldliness is up upon our heels and constantly trying to enter in our hearts and in our homes and our churches, then how do we begin the process of guarding ourselves? Watch the text. The Bible says something very powerful. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. God says you got to protect what you let in your mind. Look at what it says. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God says, watch what you let in your mind. You know, there are ways that things can get in your mind. It's what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, and what you touch. These are what's called avenues to the soul, the mind. And it is these things that God says, gird up, protect, guard what comes in your mind. There's another time where you read gird up the loins, and that is in Ephesians 6 when it talks about the armor of God. So literally, when you think of the armor of God, God is saying, put on the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, shield of faith. God says, take all these things, guard what comes up in your mind. So this is how we can protect ourselves from the influence of worldliness. We have to think about what do I let in my mind? What are the avenues that I can let things in my mind? And this is why the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinketh in his heart or mind, so is he. This is why God is so serious about what you expose and what I expose our minds to. Because whatever we expose our minds to becomes part of our thought processes. And whatever we think in our minds is what's going to be revealed in our characters. It is because of this that God says, protect yourself. The reason why some of us, if not all of us perhaps, dress the way we dress today is because of what we allowed in our minds. The way that many of us eat today, what we eat today, is because of what we allowed allowed in our minds. Even the way of, that we talk. I meet young black men in the U.S. all the time, and I see young black brothers, and they, they walk with this limp. And I'm looking at these young black boys, and I'm saying to myself, why are you walking like that? Where did you learn? You didn't come out your mother's womb walking like that. Where did he learn that from? He learned it because he was watching a bunch of hip-hop videos, and when he was watching all the hip-hop videos, he saw everybody else walking with the limp. So then they said, well, let me start walking with the limp. But I'd love to say it's just black boys, but no, it's not. It's a bunch of Filipino boys, too. Because I see a whole bunch of Filipino brothers, all of a sudden they're turning their hats sideways and turning it backwards. Why do you do that? It, you do that because of what you were beholding. It's what you let in your mind. So this is why God says, be careful what you allow your mind to see, smell, hear, taste, touch, because as a man thinks in his heart, yea, mind, so he shall be in his character. This is why when you think of the first angel's message, it has a wonderful protective mechanism in it. Let me show you what it is. The Bible says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God, and do what? Give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Now, I want you to think about this. God lets us know, I want you to fear me and give glory to me because you are living in a time of judgment. I'm going to focus our study this afternoon on giving glory to God. And what does that mean practically? The best way we can do that is and, and to entertain the question, what is the glory of God? We are to fear God and give glory to him. Now, let's watch how the Bible speaks to our heart. In Exodus 33, 18, Moses comes to God and he says, Lord, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Show me thy glory. 
God says, no problem. And then he comes in verse 19 and he says, I will make all my goodness pass before thee and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So notice Moses wants to see God's glory. God responds by saying, I'll show you my goodness and I'll proclaim my name. Well, let's notice what exactly is the glory of God. When did God reveal his goodness, proclaim his name and show his glory? It was in Exodus 34, five through seven. He fulfilled his promise to Moses. And here's what he did. It says, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. So notice that God revealed unto Moses his character. So whenever you think of the glory of God, we are to understand the glory of God is God's what? Excellent. The glory of God is God's character. Now, understanding that, now let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Now we can consider this verse and we can really appreciate it. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, the Bible says something beautiful. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. Now, the Apostle Paul, if you study 1 Corinthians 10 carefully, the Apostle Paul was giving instructions on eating foods that were offered to uh, the brethren. Like if they were going in someone's house and somebody offered you food, Paul says, don't ask them any questions like, you know, where was this made? Was this offered to an idol? He says, you don't ask those questions. He says, go ahead and receive it gladly. Now this is of course food that was clean, things that were permissible to be eaten. Paul would say, go ahead, just go ahead and eat it. But he says, but if the person said, listen, this is food that was offered to an idol. If they make it known to you that it was corrupt, Paul says, then you are to reject it. So Paul was saying this because he said, listen, the goal that we want to do is win these people, so we need to be mindful about how we address them when they offer certain things that we do not unduly offend. Therefore, he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, another application we can make is that whatever we eat and whatever we drink, it should bring glory to God or it should help reflect God's character. It should enable me to reflect God's character and it should be in and of itself that which reflects God's character. So when I think about eating and drinking, when I think about that, then I now have to consider whatever I eat and whatever I drink, will this enable me to reflect God's character? So we put alcohol on the list. When I think of alcoholic beverages, these are things that is very much promoted in the world. But these are things that should not be part of the Christian's intake. Why? Because the Bible says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. These are the very characteristics of Satan. God literally equated the characteristics of Satan with alcohol. Wine is a mocker. Satan mocked Christ. Wine is raging. The dragon was wroth. Wine is a deceiver. The Bible says Satan's work is to deceive. That's why he came as a serpent. Wine is literally indicative of the very character of Satan. Why would we want to think, drink something that reflects the character of Satan when God said whatsoever you drink should reflect the character of God? Do you understand, saints? So therefore, it makes no sense for the child of God that is intelligent to still indulge in these type of practices inside of their diet. Anything that inebriates and medicates the mind that we cannot understand God and his truth should not be in our system. And don't you tell me about moderation. You want to see biblical moderation? Go to Proverbs 24. Because sometimes people say, well, listen, I drink alcohol, but I drink it moderately. Brothers and sisters, would you, how, many, how many of you ever heard of uh, cocaine? You heard of cocaine? Do they have that here in the Philippines? If somebody came to you and said, listen, I only take cocaine moderately, what would be your counsel to them? You would say, listen, that's foolish, man. You need to come off of that stuff. Is that right? We understand how to tell people when something poisonous to your system, you don't take poison moderately. You get off of it. So what really is biblical moderation? Proverbs 24. 
In Proverbs 24, the Bible says this, very beautiful text of scripture, and it's in reference to honey. This is why I want to encourage you, please don't call yourself vegans. We are not vegans, brothers and sisters. Vegans don't eat honey. Vegans don't wear leather. Vegans go around talk, what they, vegans honor and give homage to sun, moon, and stars and constellations. Vegans deem themselves as little demigods on this earth. We are not vegans. We are health reformers, brothers and sisters. And here's the reason why I know we're not vegans especially. Vegans don't eat honey because that is a damage to the quote unquote bee kingdom and they don't want to have any part of that. But what does the Bible say in Proverbs 24 verse 13? The Bible says in Proverbs 24 13, my son, eat thou honey. Why? Because it's good. God himself said, honey is good. Go ahead and eat it. So I know I'm not a vegan because vegans don't eat honey, but I do. But here it is that even though God says eat honey, now why did God say eat honey according to the verse? Why did he say eat honey? Because it's what? Good. So if it's good, then we can eat it. Now watch Proverbs 25, 16. In Proverbs 25, 16, the Bible goes on to say, hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. That is the balance of biblical, biblical moderation. Biblical moderation teaches only consume that which is good. But even when you consume that which is good, you must consume it judiciously. You cannot overindulge in it because if you do, that is how the body can have an adverse reaction. This is why tofu is good, but you don't want to eat too much of it. This is why a lot of things in life are good, but if you overindulge in it, this is when it can become, create problems with us. Wheat is good, brothers and sisters, but wheat can also be very mucus forming. So therefore you wanna keep in mind, I don't wanna overindulge. So maybe you need to switch up your grains. One time you do wheat, another time you do quinoa, another time you do another grain. Switch it up, God believes in diversity. So therefore, when you think about this, brothers and sisters, alcohol does not fit the picture. You cannot drink alcohol moderately because there is no such thing as taking poison moderately. We only take what's good moderately. Are you following? But that, if that's true for alcohol, certainly it must be true for coffee. When you think about all the caffeine, which beclouds the intellect, benumbs the energies, excites the nervous system, and then later depresses and exhausts the body. Think about it. Coffee excites the nervous system and can actually cause irritability. God says in 1 Corinthians 14, I am not the author of confusion, but of peace. So whatever I drink should keep my nervous system in a state of peace, not put my nervous system in a state of confusion. So I can literally look at coffee and say, this is not drinking to the glory of God because it produces a characteristic that is anti-God. This is why God's people do not want to indulge in caffeinated beverages, whether it be coffee or Sprite or Coca-Cola or any of these things. It is not to the glory of God. But it's not just that, it's the unclean animals, isn't it? Bible makes it very clear. And you know, it's funny because we Seventh-day Adventists, now, now remember friends, I, I told you that I'm gonna talk to you. I told you we're gonna talk about some strong things from the word of God. So I want you to pay attention because we haven't really scratched the surface yet. We're about to get deeper in this. God wants us to understand, he wants us to be separate from the world. The world right now is indulgent. The world just wants to eat what it wants to eat, drink what it wants to drink, do what it wants to do. It's a spirit of worldliness. God has actually called his people to be temperate in all things. So therefore, when we think about the avoiding of worldliness, it is not indulging in the things that are destructive to our system. God said in relation to the unclean animals, they shall be even an abomination unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh, but ye shall have their carcasses in abomination. Notice that the Bible says these are abominations unto you. A pig is not unclean of itself, but it's unclean to us as God's people. So this is why we don't eat pork, bacon, and ham. This is why we should not eat rabbits, hares, and rodents. This is why we should not eat web-footed birds like ducks and otherwise. This is why we should not eat birds of prey like hawks and eagles and so on. This is why we do not eat shellfish, eat eels and snails and all sorts of mussels and frogs and these type of things. They are labeled in the word of God as unclean and they are an abomination unto us. Are you following? But let me tell you something, I'm gonna be honest with you. This is where it gets sad. This is where it gets sad because we are still fairly good 
when it comes to unclean. We, we know how to tell the world unclean animals are not to be part of the diet of God's people. We know how to tell the world that. But when it comes to this, we have a problem. One day, we know that God permitted man to consume flesh, clean animals. But in Genesis 9, 3, and 4, God said something here that we have not considered. And I want you to look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. God made it clear, this is before there were Jewish people. This is Genesis 9. This is during the days of Noah, brothers and sisters. There were only Gentiles, non-Jews. There was no Jewish people. It is not a Jewish law to take the blood out of the animal before you consume it. It is a total law that God has made once he allowed man to consume clean animals. God made it clear that we are not to consume clean animals. We're talking about your chicken. We're talking about your turkey. We're talking about your fish, and we're talking about your beef. God made it clear, I don't want even the clean animals to be eaten if the blood still remains in it. The blood is to be removed. And it wasn't just the blood, it was something else. Fat. God made it clear in his word. He said, it shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that ye eat neither fat nor blood. God made it clear, I don't want my people consuming the fat of animals, and I do not want my people consuming the blood that is in the animal. So many of us, we can tell the world, stay away from pork, shrimp, lobster, and crab, but yet we will tell them, get off of those unclean animals while we're eating our hamburgers with the blood and fat in it. We are just as much sinners as the individual who eats the unclean animal. Somebody says, wait a minute. God said, don't eat it. He didn't say it was a sin. Oh, yes, he did. He said it right here. In 1 Samuel 14, 32 and 33, the Bible is clear. Notice what the Bible says. And the people flew upon the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground. And the people did eat them with the blood. Then they told Saul, saying, behold, the people what? The people sin against the Lord in that they eat with the blood. To eat animals with the blood still in it, the Bible says it's a sin. It is not just a bad health habit. It is not just unhealthy and, and not wise. It's a sin. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that if you go to any of your local areas here right now, you get some chicken, and you get chicken, and when you bite into it, you see the pinkish meat color, you can look down to the bone, you see the blood spots on the bone, and you see the veins and all that. That means you're eating the chicken with the blood still in it. God actually says, when we do that, God says that's a sin. It's just as much a sin as eating pork. That's pretty eye-opening, isn't it? Remember, brothers and sisters, you know, what I, you know what I like about this study? If you love Jesus, you know what I learned? When you're married, you do things to please your spouse. If, you, if Jesus lets you know, this doesn't please me. I don't, want you to eat, I don't want you to die, Israel. You see, that's what Jesus was saying. Why do people get so sick from eating flesh? What's the big deal about flesh anyhow? Brothers and sisters, it's very simple. Disease flows through blood. You eat the animal with the blood, you get its disease. God was trying to simply say, I love you. I, I don't want you to die. I want you to live. I want you to have a happy life, not a sick life. So God says, don't eat the animals with the blood and fat. That's where all the disease stays encased in it. So it's a message of love, not a message of hate. He doesn't want to hurt you. He wants to bless you. He wants you to be happy, healthy. So God makes it clear. So notice, before there were Jews, God says, eat the flesh, but no blood. Then during the Jewish dispensation, God says, if you eat the animal with the blood, it's a sin. But somebody says, well, that's the Old Testament. I'm a New Testament Christian. That's what some people say. I'm a New Testament Christian. Where's that in the New Testament? No problem. It's right here. Acts 15. In Acts 15, 19 and 20, the Judaizers, they were people that were constantly going to the new believing Gentile Christians. And they were going to them and saying, listen, we understand that you Gentiles are now being accepted with Christ, but you still got to keep some of the laws of Moses. You got to get circumcised. You got to do this. You got to do that. It created such a stir that literally they had to have what's called a general council. Kind of like today, how we have a general conference in session. They had to call a general council together and they had to find out what rules should we give to the new believing Gentiles when it comes to certain lifestyle practices and habits? The answer was, wherefore, 
my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. It is a New Testament teaching that God still makes it clear he does not want his people consuming anything that has its blood in it. So God wants us to understand that if we are going to demonstrate Christ likeness in a sinful world, we can't practice the sins of the world. And one of the sins of the world that we must reconcile with as God's people is when you eat flesh, clean flesh with the blood still in it, it is sin. Amen? Amen? So now, God says, this is the change that I want to bring amongst my people. God says, I love you. I am Listen, brothers and sisters, remember, ministry of education, not condemnation, right? That's right. So walk in the light. You walk in the light, you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear. But if you see the light and you say, I don't care, I want my chicken, I'm going to die with my chicken. If you have that kind of attitude, you are going to die with your chicken. You're going to be eternally separated from God. And it's not worth it, saints. So God says, I'm giving this information to my people because I want you to thrive. I want you to be a light. I want you to be my blessed little light bearers that when the rest of the world is getting sick, they can look at the saints and say, surely you are wise and understanding people. You're not sick like us. Did you know God wanted us to be a spectacle? Did you know that? He wanted us to be a spectacle before men and angels. There's something sweet than when, when the doctor can take your blood work. And when they take your blood work, they say, all of your levels are exactly where everything needs to be. Your cholesterol, perfect. Your blood pressure, cur perfect. Your glucose levels, perfect. Everything. Your BMI, perfect, perfect. That's a witness, brothers and sisters. And this is what Christ wants all of us to be. So you know what happens next? When you and I have that kind of health, you know what the doctors are going to say? They're going to say, what are you doing? What are you doing? And that's the open door. We keep talking about the health messages are entering wedge, but we forget we were supposed to be the message. We love telling people, don't eat meat, but then we'll go ahead and sneak around the corner and eat meat. So we'll go ahead and think health message is telling them a word and then otherwise. No, you're supposed to be the health message. And God doesn't want you to go extreme, saints. He doesn't want you to go crazy. In other words, there are some people in the U.S., they believe in health reform, but some of them, their teeth are yellow, their skin is flush, they look skeletal. Very weak, eyes dark, little shadows under their eyes. I mean, these things are clear demonstrations that something's wrong. This is not a faithful application of health reform. And the reason why this is so is because when you read Daniel 1, the Bible said it on purpose. When Daniel said, we will not eat the king's meat and we will not drink his drink, give us water and give us pulse, test us in 10 days, the Bible specifically says that when Daniel was tested, it said his skin was fairer and fatter. God's people should not look flushed. We should not look worn. We should not look depleted. We should not look sickly. So there are some individuals who take health reform and they are extremists. And they are in a very weak and debilitated state, but they're talking about health principles. God says beware of fanaticism. He's given us a balanced message that should be demonstrated even in the physiology, brothers and sisters. So God has given us these counsels because he loves us and he wants us to do his will and to honor him. But it's not just diet, it's also music and song. If we are children of God, young people, listen to me. If we are children of God, God wants you to understand that even in your music and in your singing, he wants you to demonstrate something different from the world. You see, the Bible says... Watch the text. The Bible says very carefully, very beautifully, he hath put a what kind of song? A new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. If you are in Christ, brothers and sisters, you should have a new song. You shouldn't be meditating on the old songs of life. But not only that, watch this. Let the word of Christ, now watch this verse carefully. It's actually very powerful. Let the what? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. They're teaching and admonishing one another in what? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now watch this. The psalms, the hymns, and the spiritual songs all 
should reflect the words of Christ. That's what the verse says. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So all the songs that we listen to, all the songs that we sing should be reflective and in harmony with the words of Christ. Whenever we listen to songs that talk about fornication, that is not a song that God can endorse. When we listen to songs that talk about gun, gunshots and murder and death and lying and cheating and stealing, these are things that God cannot approve because they contradict the words of Christ. Christ says, whatever songs you sing, whatever songs you listen to, whatever MP3s that you have downloaded on your iPad, iPhone, and everything else, God says those songs better reflect my words. Otherwise, we need to tear ourselves away from it, and we need to understand what that means. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, turn there with me. What does God want us to do? In other words, somebody says, well, I got some, un I got some ungodly, uh, worldly songs on my MP3. I have some ungodly and worldly songs on my CD collection. I have ungodly and worldly songs and all these different things. Well, what does the Bible say we should do? Matthew chapter 5. The Bible says right there in Matthew chapter 5, look at what it says as we consider verse 29 and 30. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, 29 and 30, it says, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. Verse 30, and if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. God makes it clear when something offends you, when something is pulling you away from God, God's message is clear, get rid of it. Cut it off. So when you got something on your MP3 player that reflects the people of the world and the music of the world, your Jay-Z's, your Beyonce's, your Justin Bieber's, and all of the different artists out there that are singing and lifting up songs that are contrary to the words of Christ, God says, cut it off or delete it. Get rid of it. Why? Because if you keep listening to it, it'll create a greater bond to it, and you're going to find it harder to leave it. And brothers and sisters, Christ is coming to destroy one thing. Did you know that? Christ is coming to destroy one thing, only one thing. Did you know Christ has no mission to destroy people? You know what Jesus wants to destroy? Sin. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 29, that God is a consuming fire. That's why sin can't thrive in its presence. God consumes sin. He's a consuming fire. When sin comes in his presence, he burns it up. That's why God does not look at us face to face right now. It's an act of mercy. As long as we got sin in our hearts, God says, I can't show you my face because if I did, you'll die. This is why the work of Christ right now is to remove sin from our hearts. Because if he can remove it from our hearts, then he can come to us face to face and we don't have to perish. Now watch this. If these forms of music are things that are worldly and offend God, then brothers and sisters, if we continue to harbor these things in our heart, then when Christ comes to destroy sin, he must destroy it where it's found. And if he finds that sin is still residing in your heart and in mine, then we must be destroyed with it. But God says, Israel, I don't want you to perish. I want you to live. And that's why he says, let me take it away. Christ says, I can take it away. Brothers and sisters, I used to be hip hop. No, you don't understand. I didn't listen to hip hop. I was hip hop. Hip hop is a culture. It's a lifestyle. And I totally lived the hip hop lifestyle. Everything about me was hip hop. From the way that I walked to the way that I dressed to the way that I talked. It was more than just what I listened to. So when God had to take me out of the entertainment industry, it was imperative. He couldn't just pull me out of the industry. He had to take the lifestyle out of me. He had to show me how to walk like a regular human being. He had to show me how to talk like a man with intelligence. He had to show me how to be Christ-like. And you know what? I haven't arrived, but I'm not the same man I was. And what I can tell you is God has incredible delivering power. And therefore, remember, we studied. We said, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, right? So when we think about this, remember, the glory of God is God's character. So here's what you do. Whenever you get music that you're thinking about getting, right? Here are some acid tests that you can put to the music. Number one, I want you to watch this. This is good. 
Very, very good. God is pure. Remember, the glory of God is God's what? His character. So an attribute of God's character is that he is pure. So whatever music you listen to, it should be pure. It should not have lyrics of defilement in it. If a person is cursing, you need to get rid of that MP3. If a person is talking about fornication, you need to get rid of that MP3. If a person is promoting lies and deceptions and self-glory, then you need to get rid of that MP3. None of these things promote biblical purity. But God is not just pure, he is also true. Whatever you listen to, it should be truthful. It should not be filled with lies and with errors. We should not entertain ourselves with error and with lies. Whatever is true is what we should be listening to. Also, God is holy. Whatever music you listen to, it should have a holy influence. If you're listening to music that reminds you of when you were in the world doing worldly things, brothers and sisters, that's not a holy influence, that's a satanic influence. Satan wants to bring you back into sin. God wants to keep you from sin. So whenever you listen to music, music, it doesn't even have to have lyrics, music, if that music you can say, man, I remember I used to party to that. I remember I used to dance in the clubs to that. I remember when I used to practice all sorts of immorality to these songs. When those songs give that vibe to you, brothers and sisters, that is a clear indicator this is not reflecting the glory of God. Not only that, God is a God of peace. When music begins to make your heart rate go into palpitations, when music begins to cause your mind to not focus on what is right or wrong anymore because now you're just caught up in the atmosphere of the music, whenever the music puts your body in a state of confusion, have you ever listened to music and literally your heart rate starts going faster? Do you have gymnasiums out here? Do you have gyms here in the Philippines? Do you have gyms? Have you ever gone into a gym and heard people playing classical music? You never heard it, have you? Never. You would never go into a gym and hear, zin, 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 hear violins and cellos. You wouldn't hear that. You're going to hear drums. You're going to hear boom, 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 boom. Why? Because they want you to, whoo, whoo, whoo. they want you to do that workout, right? They want, they want to motivate you to, to work and, and, whoo, 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 and they want you to work hard. You know what that teaches us? That teaches us that music is not neutral. That means that music can influence behavior. And this is why we can't believe the lie that I can just take any form of music and just put Christian lyrics to it and it's okay. Brothers and sisters, music creates atmospheres. It creates moods. It influences behavior. And it's because of that that when we listen to music, we have to say, what kind of influence is this having over me? What effect is this having on my mind? Can I concentrate? Can I read my Bible and still study the Word of God while that music is playing and stay focused? Or does that music make me want to just close my Bible and get up the video games, get into a fight, or maybe play some type of sport? What does that music do to you, brothers and sisters? These are things that you start testing. Not only that, God is love. Whatever you listen to should promote love for God and love for your fellow man. Do you know that if we made a rule to only listen to music of this nature, we would find our hearts and our homes healthier, happier, and most importantly, holier places. And this is what Christ wants for us, living in a time of judgment. But it's not just music, brothers and sisters. It's TV, videos, and theater as well. We have to be mindful. Some of us, we don't go to the movie theater, but we sure will bring it to our house. But these are forms of worldliness, my brothers and sisters. We have to understand the Bible says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. David says, I'm not going to put any wicked thing before mine eyes. So then how can we watch movies when people are shooting each other? That's wicked. How can we watch movies where people are literally murdering, practicing premarital sex, and doing all of these sinful base behaviors, and we have the nerve to call it entertainment? That's worldliness, brothers and sisters. We can't please God. And what a tragedy it is. New converts come into the church, and we say, hey, come to our house and come have potluck with us. And they come to our homes, and they see our DVD collection, and they see all these worldly programs. They see all these things that are referencing the things of the world. They say, man, what church did I join? Did I join another movement filled with hypocrites? Did I join another movement filled with hypocrisy? 
Brothers and sisters, we have to understand, set no wicked thing before your eyes. If fornication is evil, then you shouldn't watch it. Think about it this way. I want you to think about this with me. If um, married people in the room, if you're married, you know, you got your spouse with you. If you are walking with your spouse down the streets of the Philippines, Iloilo City, you're walking down, and as you're walking down, all of a sudden a stranger comes to your wife, and a stranger comes to your wife and kisses your wife, and then your wife kisses him back. <laughs> Would you be offended? Of course. Would you call that an act of adultery? Yes. Well, think about it. When two unmarried people in, are intimate one with another, that is an act of adultery, and we say that that's wicked, that's worldly. Yet, we will watch people like Angelina Jolie, and she will be in a movie with another actor that's not her husband, and they will kiss in that movie together, and we think it's all right and it's entertainment, where really what we're doing is we're being entertained with adultery. The same way that you would be offended if your spouse kissed a person that is not you. Why then should we watch people who are married to other people kissing each other in that movie or that television program and think it's okay? We are literally being entertained with adultery, which the Bible calls wicked. And God does not want us to put any wicked thing before our eyes. We should not entertain ourselves with this, brothers and sisters. Notice now, going on, Philippians 4 and verse 8. All you got to do, it's not that you can't watch anything, but here's your test. Whatever you watch, it should pass this test. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. If it's true, good. If it's a television program or a movie that is teaching the truth, good. But it has to continue. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. If you can find a program that has all of these elements, you can watch it. Go watch it and enjoy it. But you will find you're not going to find much at all. <laughs> That's the only reality. You know, for children, I will say this. There's a program called Janice's Attic that used to be out many years ago. That is good programming for your children. So if you have a child that does like to watch certain things, you can give them Janice's Attic, and Janice's Attic is very, very good that you can give to your children. Janice's, J-A-N-I-C-E-S, Janice's Attic, like an attic upstairs in a house, A-T-T-I-C. Janice's Attic, that whole DVD collection is excellent for little children. So you can give them that, but brothers and sisters, there's a, you know, I believe in big screen TVs. I believe in big screen TVs. I love big, we have at our home, we have a big screen TV. Our big screen TV is so big, it can't even fit in our house. You know what it's called? Nature. <laughs> big screen TV, brothers and sisters. You can't even calculate the inches. It's huge. All you got to do is go out in nature and watch the programming. You get to watch the sun, the moon, the stars, the sky. You get to learn about the birds and the constellations. You get to learn all these blessed little things. Oh, my friends, you got to get this big screen TV. And you know what? It's free. God does not want to take away our enjoyment. He just wants to give us the right concept of enjoyment. And we can have it, brothers and sisters. So these are the things that the Lord warns us about. And he says, no, I don't want my people doing this. This is worldly. This does not please me. So this is why we do not participate and partake of things of this nature. But brothers and sisters, it's getting deeper than just what we watch and so on, but it's also about what we wear. What are Jesus' counsels when it comes to makeup, colorful cosmetics, jewelry, tattoos? What does God say about these things? These are very important because these are emblems of worldliness that has affected God's people. These are emblems of worldliness. 
Tattoos in the Bible were signs of heathenism. In other words, whenever an individual had tattoos printed on their bodies, it was a sign that they were connected with heathenism and paganism. Jeremiah 10 and verse 2 and Leviticus 19 verse 28. Literally, the Bible shows that these things were connected to paganism and heathenism. And this is why God did not want his people covering themselves and dolling themselves up with tattoos upon their bodies. But it's not just that, it was also colorful cosmetics. Did you know that colorful cosmetics were signs of sin, apostasy, and heathenism in the Bible? Literally, if you study the whole entire Bible out and look up every event, every time that somebody was dolling themselves up with lipstick and eyeshadow and all these other things, all these different colorful cosmetics. When they did that, it was always a sign of sin, a sign of apostasy, and also a sign of heathenism. And here are your verses, 2 Kings 9 and verse 30. Uh, Jeremiah 4 and verse 30, and Ezekiel 23 and verse 40. Literally, all these Bible verses, they showed that makeup and all these things, you know, colorful cosmetics. We're not talking about something that's even toned. We're talking about colorful cosmetics. Your lips, you did not come out your mother's womb with these deep red, dark lips. And you should understand the implications of that when God's people do it. Also, a lot of times the makeup comes from a lot of these roadkill, you know, animals that get killed on the street and some of these things. And these makeup companies, they literally put not only poisonous chemicals, but they also put a lot of these remaining portions of dead animals in the mixture of the things that we start rubbing on our lips and our faces. We wonder why when we put on a lot of makeup, sometimes we start breaking out with pimples and all these other things. It's a bunch of toxicity that we're putting in our system. It's not even healthy, let alone it doesn't represent God. So God doesn't want his people dolling themselves up with colorful cosmetics. It was something that was a sign of sin, a sign of heathenism, a sign of apostasy. But then there was also jewelry. Jewelry was signs of heathenism and false gods. Jewelry. And when you look at jewelry, there's a lot of Bible verses that we can consider. So I want you to look at this. Look at all these. These are all Bible verses just on the subject of jewelry. I'm giving it to you more so to write down and research because there's just no way that we can go through all of them verse by verse. It doesn't allow us enough time. In 1 Timothy 2, 9, 1 Peter 3, 3, Revelation 12, 1 to 4, compared with Revelation 17, 1 to 5, Genesis, the 35th chapter, Exodus, the 32nd chapter, Isaiah 3, 16 through 26, very powerful, Hosea 2 and verse 13, and 1 John 2, 15 and 16. I mean, these were very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. These verses were all showing God's attitude of his people donning themselves with all sorts of jewels, you know, earrings, neck chain rings, and so on. And I do have to say this, brothers and sisters, in the mind of God, there was no difference between a wedding ring and a college ring. So you can't say that wedding rings are okay while a college ring or some other ring is bad. Rings are rings in the Bible. There was no differentiation. There was none. So literally, if we're going to say a wedding ring is all right, you just endorse your young people to go ahead and put earrings and a lot of other rings on their body. Because the same way we have no biblical premises for, premise for saying that there, we can wear wedding rings is the same way they can say, well, you have no biblical premise for saying I need to take off my college ring or my earrings. So therefore, in the eyes of God, rings are rings. Now, of all these verses that talk about jewelry and God's people donning themselves with it, there is nothing that makes it more clear to me than Deuteronomy 7, 25 and 26. That verse we're going to look at. In Deuteronomy 7, God actually made a statement about jewelry that really, really hits the nail on the head. And I think you and I should consider this as God's people, his representatives. So let's consider it. I'm going to go ahead and move from this slide now, and I'm going to show us Deuteronomy 7, 25 and 26. 26. So let's consider it. In Deuteronomy 7, you see these two images here. Now, generally, I will see these images, especially when I go to restaurants in the U.S. If I, go to, if I were to go to a Chinese restaurant, even if, a, if it's a vegan Chinese restaurant, you can always see images like this. Have you ever seen images like this before? All right. And then, of course, if you go to certain Indian restaurants, you can start seeing images like this as well. Now, what do you see on these images? They're wearing what? They're wearing jewelry. Now watch what God said in Deuteronomy 7. God says, the graven images of their gods. He was talking about images, graven images. Look at the text carefully. The graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is what? Wait, 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 wait. What did God want to be done with the image? He wanted what to be done with the image? 
burn it with fire. So now it says the silver or gold that is on them. So what's the silver and what's the them? The them is what? The them is the image. So there's silver and gold on the image. What do we call that? Jewelry. So notice, thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them nor take it unto thee, talking about jewelry, lest thou be snared therein, for it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it, but thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. God's word is clear. God does not want his people donning themselves with jewelry, donning themselves with jewelry. God does not want us doing it. God says, the jewelry that is on these graven images, he says, I don't want my people wearing it. I do not want my people wearing these things. Do not put it upon you. God makes his words very clear on this point, brothers and sisters. And this is why, as God's people, we know that jewelry is a sign of worldliness. These earrings piercing your precious ears for the mere sake of trying to look good. Sisters, you were beautiful before your ears were ever touched with some blade. Before some needle, you were already beautiful. It's only the world that lied to you and made you think that you're more beautiful now that you got something hanging from your ears. But God wanted you to know you were already beautiful and godly men will let you know that you're beautiful. You don't need to put earrings on. God says, I don't want my people piercing their bodies. But yet this is what we see today. Something strange about Asia. In Asia, there's really a, an infatuation with makeup. Absolute infatuation. I mean, I've been to certain stores here in the Philippines I mean, the women look like porcelain dolls, almost. I mean, it's like literally they, their faces look so incredibly fake. Why? It's because they, they're just caked with makeup and all these things. I mean, just what an ill representation, brothers and sisters. It bears a false witness, quite honestly. I, by the way, I think it is unfair and it is very deceptive when you cover your, your real image up with all this makeup and get married to a man and then have the nerve to want to take makeup off. That's not even right, because now that brother's going to deal with an image that he's saying, I never saw this before, and he may not be pleased with it. <laughs> that's bearing a false witness. I think that's wrong. I'm serious, brothers and sisters. I remember one time, years ago, it's the truth, years ago, I was in the world, and there used to be this girl that came to our school. Her name was Tina, and Tina would come to the school, and, you know, everybody liked Tina. When Tina walked through the room, everybody was just like, wow, you know, she's so pretty. And somehow, someway, I got, I, I, I ended up winning her over and says, you know, she was willing to be my girlfriend. So I went to pick her up at the house one day and I went to pick her up at the house. And when I picked her up at the house, I knocked on the door. Now I showed up early. I told her I was going to be there at one o'clock, but I had some free time. So I showed up at 11 o'clock. So 11 o'clock, I showed up, duck, knock, knock, and I knocked on the door. Somebody said, who is it? And I, I wanted to play it off like I was, I, it wasn't me. So I was like, oh, the mailman, you know, whatever. And the person came to the door and I saw something come to the door. And I saw a face, but I had no idea who that was. And then the person goes, ah, and then she ducks. And she says, Dwayne, what are you doing here? I said, Tina? <laughs> and she said, yes. And I was like, oh no, what did I do? And next thing you know, she says, give me two hours and let me put on my face. <laughs> two hours later, she comes downstairs, and now she's the Tina that I remembered in school. And that was the first lesson. I said, you know, I don't know if I want to marry somebody that has two faces. <laughs> I, literally, I began thinking about it. I said, I don't know if I want to do that. I really began to realize, I believe that covering ourselves with all the, it's almost like bearing a false witness. We present a picture of ourselves that's not true at all. And sometimes people don't really know what we look like and what we are representing ourselves as. So, you know, I understand that, you know, it probably makes you laugh, but I'm really not trying to make you laugh. I'm trying to make a point that it is imperative that we understand God does not want us covering ourselves with all these artificials. It bears a false witness. It stimulates a greater desire for more artificial. You are beautiful sisters just in your natural selves. And all you need is to make sure that there is a godly man that can appreciate you just for who you are. But you don't need to go around putting all this fakeness and all these things on yourself. You're making your body sick, you're bearing a false witness, you're not really happy, and a lot of times makeup ends up causing all these undue wrinkles, pimples, and all these other things later on in life anyhow. Who needs all of that? And most importantly, it displeases God. It is an image of worldliness.
It is for these reasons that God says, I want my people to come out of it because worldliness does not please God. What are Jesus' principles of conduct for clothing? Jesus says very clearly, avoid immodesty. Isaiah 3, 16 through 26. Avoid immodesty. 1 Timothy 2, 9 and Proverbs 7, 10. Sisters, uh, you must understand that the devil has chosen you to be an instrument to take down yourselves and men. The reason we know this to be so is when Satan wanted to get Adam, he used Eve. When Satan wanted to get the children of Israel, he used the Moabite women. When Satan wanted to take down Samson, he used Delilah. When Satan wanted to take down God's virgin church, he used a whore. In the Bible, Satan often chooses to use women because he knows he can use them more effectively than he can men. It is because of this fact that, sisters, you're a target. And one of the ways men are very kinesthetic, Men respond to touch and men re are visual. They respond to what they see. So sisters, when you wear mini skirts, the Bible calls it garments of harlotry. That's what you read in Proverbs 7, verse 10. It talks about a woman who wore the garments of the attire of a harlot. When you wear clothing that reveals your cleavage, you are literally putting yourself almost, as it were, in the hands of Satan, and he's using you to try to not only to destroy you, but he also wants to destroy the men as well. So therefore, it is not desirous of God, and it does not please God when his daughters are wearing mini skirts, tight-fitting clothing, wearing things that are low cleavage and revealing your anatomy and physiology. It is a sin. Literally, God hates it. God does not want you to do these things, saints. You understand? God does not want, it displeases him. So literally, this is why he says avoid immodesty. This is why he talks about it. In 1 Timothy 2.9, he says, women should wear that which is modest apparel. This is literally what God says. And the word apparel is a, uh, katastole. yes, it's a Greek word called katastole. What it means is long flowing dress, long flowing garment, let down garment. So when you think of a woman, a woman should wear a clothing that is long enough and loose enough that it hides what is called nakedness. It is not just that, but also God teaches dress for health and simple beauty and seek to glorify God. So literally, God makes it clear. God told the priests in Exodus 28 that I want you to dress for beauty and for glory. First, Tim First Peter 2.9 says we are a royal priesthood. So when you think about yourself, we are a royal priesthood. So how should we dress? For beauty and for glory. That's why it's okay to look beautiful. That's why it's okay, gentlemen, to look handsome. We should be able to look decent, well-kept, well-groomed. All of this is in harmony with the Word of God. It should be healthy. It should be things that promote the grand lifestyle that God wants us to have. Therefore, make plain distinctions between male and female clothing. That was also something with God. Deuteronomy 22, 5. The Bible says a woman should not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, and neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. All who do so are an abomination unto the Lord. So the Bible makes it clear that God wants us to make plain distinctions between male and female clothing. And we are living in a time, brothers and sisters, where we need to be more deliberate about this. Because Satan is on a mission to cause cross-gendering between humanity. Have you noticed the men are looking more like women and the women are looking more like men? This is happening all over our world right now. All over the world. It's not just the Philippines. It's not just America. It's in Africa. It's everywhere. So God says, my people, I want them to maintain plain distinction. Let the men look like men. Let the women look like women. And I wish we could have some time to really go into some serious principles on dress reform. Really talking about dress reform and how do we make these things practical. 
Brothers and sisters, God says that we are a peculiar people. We are a holy nation and we are a royal priesthood. It is for these reasons, brothers and sisters, that what are Jesus' principles of conduct regarding clothing and jewelry? Notice that Peter and Paul did speak of the ornaments God wants his people to wear. What are the ornaments God wants his people to wear? A meek and quiet spirit and good works. When we fall in love with Jesus, it is a sheer joy and pleasure to live his lifestyle. This is what God wants to bring across to us. He wants us to understand that everything that we do is to please him. The things that we have studied are manifestations of worldliness. They don't please God. And we have to be willing to call sin out and identify some of these things by its right name. God wants us to understand that we are not pleasing him when we demonstrate worldliness in clothing, worldliness in, in, in artificial adornment, worldliness in how we eat and drink and how we live. These are things, brothers and sisters, that do not please God. And these are the things he wants to take away from our hearts. Somebody says, well, we live in a day of determined, independent thinking, even when it comes to spiritual matters. What does Jesus say about such thinking? Notice what the Bible says. Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. Don't do what's right in your own eyes. Don't leave here and say, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want anyhow. That is a position of death, brothers and sisters. The Bible goes on to say, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Choose life, brothers and sisters. Don't choose a path that seems right and feels right, but at the end of the day, it is literally a path of death and destruction. The Bible says the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Brothers and sisters, follow the counsels of God's word. When God calls you out of these lifestyle habits, God is not trying to make your life unpleasant. He's trying to make your life pleasant. He's actually trying to make you happy. When you think about he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Do not trust what you think and what you feel. Our hearts are deceitful. I always tell people, if somebody came knocking at your door and said, hello, I am deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Could you please let me in your house? Would you let that person in your house? You wouldn't do it. Well, brothers and sisters, it's very simple. God says in Jeremiah 17, 9, our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So therefore, why would you trust your own heart? The same way we would not trust the man that comes to our home and admits he's evil and desperately wicked, why should we trust our hearts when God says it is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked? So do not trust your heart. Truly, he that trusts in his own heart is really a fool. Don't be a fool, be wise. And therefore, what really happens when I disregard what God says and do what I want anyhow? What is it that really happens? The Bible says, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. It is as if we literally put Jesus back on the cross every time we profess his name and do what we want rather than what he says. It is as if we have put him right back on Calvary all over again. We renew the pain, and God does not want us to put him through pain. Remember, putting someone through pain and pleasing someone is opposite. Our mission is to please him and not to put him through pain. Therefore, the question is simple. How can I adopt and follow these Bible guidelines without appearing pharisaical, judgmental, or legalistic? How do I do it? How can I help others see it? So when people look at us and say, why do you dress the way you dress? Why do you eat the way you eat? Why do you live the way you live? Why is it you listen to what you listen to? Why, why, why? Rather than giving some pharisaical, judgmental, or legalistic answer, it's very simple. Why do we do these things? If ye love me, keep my commandments. They say, Dwayne, why do you eat this way? Because I love Jesus. Why is it that you worship this way? Because I love Jesus. Why do you keep the Sabbath? It's because I love Jesus. Why is it that you eat or live or listen to only these forms of music? It's because I love Jesus and I don't want anything to separate me from him. Such a simple answer. It's a simple answer, isn't it? Love. Love makes it easy. What does Jesus say are the results of doing the things that please him? If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Notice that the reason Christ gave us all these counsels we study today is that his joy might remain in us. You see, some of us think, if I take my jewelry off, if I take my makeup off, if I start dressing modestly, 
If I get rid of the bad music, if I start eating right, if I start living right, if I start doing all these things, my life will be miserable. Jesus says that's what Satan wants you to believe. Jesus says the exact opposite takes place. He says my joy will remain in you and your joy will be full. Sin never makes you happy, brothers and sisters. Sin is just a cheap thrill that you're going to need more and more and more of it to stay in the thrill state. And sooner or later, it just knocks you down. But God's joy is so everlasting. It is so peaceful. It brings a great peace and harmony to our hearts. And this is what the Lord wants to give to all of us. I want you to think about it this way, and I close on this point. Sometimes people always ask the question, and I'm asked this question often, Brother Lemon, how can I honestly live this kind of lifestyle and maintain my joy and my happiness? How could it really happen? I see what God says, it is clear, and I can't refute it, but how do I really live this way? Well, I give you this story. There was a story of a young lady. She was in college, and what she would do is she would read, you know, the various books that were assigned to her in school. And one day, uh, she was assigned a specific book that she had to read to pass the class. And as she would read the book, she just felt to herself, this book is so boring. And it was hard for her to read it. She was like, man, every time I try to read this book, it's just so boring. I get confused. My mind starts wondering. And she would just close the book. And as far as she's concerned, she's thinking, you know what? I'm just going to probably fail this class because I just can't seem to get it in my mind to actually read this book and take it seriously. Well, one day uh, when she came to class, the professor that she had was gone and a new professor came in. The new professor happened to be a very handsome gentleman, a very well-dressed and very astute and good-statured individual. So she saw him and she said, wow, he is really handsome. Well, it turned out that when he saw her, he said, wow, she's really pretty. So lo and behold, in a short period of time, they began to let their attraction be known to one another and a courtship took place. As they started going in courtship, she, be, she was telling her professor, you know, she says, I don't know what it is, but she's like, I'm trying to pass this class. I'm trying to go through this book. But she says, for some reason, this book, it just seems like I can't just embrace it and really take it in. Every time I read it, I get a little bored and I just want to put it away. All of a sudden, the professor starts laughing. The professor starts laughing really hard. And she says, what are you laughing at? And he said, I wrote that book. <laughs> when she discovered that he wrote the book. She said, wait a minute, you wrote the book? He said, yes, I did. She said, wow, isn't that something? Later that night, guess what she was doing all the way up into the late hours? Reading the book. <laughs> she's reading the book. And she's just going page after page. And she's reading that book and she is just loving this book. <laughs> Question. What made the difference? You know what made the difference? Did the book change? It was the same book, wasn't it? You know what made the difference? She knew the author. Do you get it? You see, what will help you follow the Bible, what will help you begin to really see these counsels of God as a help and not a hindrance is when you know the author. You see, the more you get to know Christ, the more you get to understand him, the more you begin to see the character of God in your study of the word, what happens is by beholding Jesus, a change takes place in your heart and you begin to love the one that you're learning about. And you know what always helps when it comes to the counsels of God? Ladies and gentlemen, love makes it easy. When you love the author, when you know the author, and you love them, it's not hard to let go of what God tells you to let go of. I firmly believe the only reason that God's people are still rebellious and wearing jewelry, wearing colorful cosmetics, dressing in immoral and immodest manners, listening to foul music, watching bad programs, reading novels, and doing all these things that the Word of God condemns, the only reason we're not doing it is we have an issue with love for our Creator. And therefore, I encourage you, Get to know God as it is your privilege to know him. When you read your Bible, don't just look for facts. Look for God. Look for his character. Try to understand it. Jesus says, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Have you seen Christ's character in the study of scripture? And the more that you behold God, I just want to leave you with this one thought. And I, boy, I tell you, this thought was such a sweet revelation to me. 
Do you remember when it showed God's character and it said, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering? Did you notice that God was revealing an order of how his character works? In other words, does God believe in punishment? Does God believe in punishing? Yes, he does. God believes in visiting iniquity. But did you notice he left it last? Here was the order. It says, the Lord descended in the cloud, and the Lord stood before him there and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Then, after all of this, if we reject all of this, then God says, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. God says, this is my character. I do visit judgment. I do punish. There does come a time where God says, I must now discipline and allow my mercy to run out and let my judgment fall. But God says, but before that, I'm merciful. Before that, I'm gracious. Before that, I'm long-suffering. I had to learn this as a parent, because sometimes parents, when they deal with their children, they immediately visit the iniquity, but they were not merciful. They were not gracious. They were not long-suffering. They were not abundant in goodness and truth. They were not keeping mercy for thousands, and they were not forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. They went immediately to visiting iniquity, and that's why we have some children today that immediately visit iniquity when they run into the trials of their lives. They never learned the character of God. God loves you, brothers and sisters. Every counsel we have studied today is a manifestation of God's mercy. Did you know that? God is actually being merciful to us. He says, I'm trying to preserve your happiness when you stay away from worldliness. God says, I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you because I love you. And if you are willing to receive the love that God has given to us today through his spoken word, if you're willing to receive that love and put your life in harmony with it, what this means is that there's some MP3s that need to be deleted. There's going to be some DVDs that need to be gotten rid of. There's going to need to be a change in how some of us dress. There's going to be a need to eliminate certain things that we listen to, watch, and otherwise, and a putting on more worship, more Bible study, more time in sharing and witnessing. If you're really willing to let not your will, but God's will be done and comply with the principles that the Lord has taught us today, would you please stand to your feet with me? You're standing to your feet because you're saying, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. You understand there's a cost. There's a cost. There's a cost. And as you stand, I want you to know that Christ stands with you. He loves you, brothers and sisters. He wants you to be saved. He doesn't want you to be lost. The rest of the churches in the world, they are imitating the things of worldliness, but God has raised up a remnant. And God says, through my remnant, they will not be reflectors of the world, but they will be reflectors of Christ, their righteousness. And it will be seen in our dress. It will be seen in our behaviors. It will be seen in our actions, brothers and sisters. And the world will see the character of God. And then they'll be willing to hear the story of God as we tell it. This is the most effective means of witnessing. May God help us to be faithful. I'm going to go to my knees to seal the decision we have made today. If you are able to, join with me and let us go to our knees together. And if you cannot kneel, then bow your heads where you are, but let's reverently approach the Lord in prayer and seal the decisions we have made today. Loving Father, we are so grateful. Truly, your spirit has spoken to our hearts today. We thank you, O oh God, for your tender mercy and grace. We thank you for the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you will bless my brothers and my sisters, that we will realize that if we follow the counsels of God, this is only your method of joy remaining in us and our joy being full. And Lord, I pray that you will bless my brothers and sisters that as they make the various sacrifices to please you, 
Lord, help them to remember we're not doing it for creature merit, but we're doing it because we love you. Increase our love, we pray. Continue to draw us close to thine heart. And thank you so much for what you have taught us today. Truly, let not our will, but yours be done. Is our prayer we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.